Imagine yourself dropped into the middle of a historic battle, right in the center of it, with it raging all around you. What, what would that feel like? What would that look like? To hear the whine and the whiz of the bullets zipping, zipping by. To hear the roar of the cannons or the bombs. To see the flashes of light. To feel the, and smell the, the heat and the smoke. To hear the cries of the dying and the wounded or the shouts of orders. It's kind of hard to imagine that if you've never been in one, right? I've never been in a battle before. But that experience of being in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a surrounding battle is the goal of the Battle of Gettysburg Cyclorama. Isn't that a neat word? Cyclorama. Who's heard of that word before? Does anybody even know what a cyclorama is? <laughs> okay, a few of you do. A cyclorama is uh, it's basically a panoramic image or painting or picture that goes 360 degrees around you. So while Pastor C.D. says the Sight and Sounds Theater is 180 degrees, this is 360 degrees. It's all the way around you. Of course, the, the, the picture is, is still, but the, the presence of lights and sounds gives the effect of the person standing in the middle of it the sense of being in the middle of what's being depicted all around. This particular cyclorama at the Gettysburg National Museum, as I understand it, if you were to lay it flat, would extend 77 feet longer than a football field. And it's more than four stories tall. It's huge. And imagine that wrapped completely around you in a cylindrical type room. Now, how would you describe that experience to somebody if you were trying to explain it to them? If, if you're talking to someone who has never been there before or someone who's never been in an actual battle, how would you go about explaining your experience? Well, naturally, you would do what anyone can do, and you would probably try to, to break it into chunks or segments. You would, you would take this particular aspect of the, of, the, of the depiction or this particular experience, and you would explain it, and then you would move on to the next thing. Well, that's kind of what is going on here in Revelation. John, in this vision, is surrounded by experiences and images and things that are being depicted all around him. And he's doing what, what he, all that he can to explain this to you and to me. And the challenge that you and I have as we approach this book that seems so difficult and mysterious is that a lot of what he's describing here are things that are happening simultaneously. And we tend to read these things in sequential order as if, this is exactly a, an exact chronology. And that's, that, that makes it hard, even harder to understand Revelation than it needs to be. So the challenge for you and me, anytime we, we dive into a text in Revelation, is to try to understand, well, when is this happening? What's the significance of the timing of these things? And we have to pay special attention and, pay, and focus so that we can really understand what's going on. So this morning, as you have your Bibles, you've probably already seen in your bulletin, we're going to be in chapter 4. Really, chapter 4 and 5 belong together, and they are perhaps the most significant piece of the cyclorama of Revelation. Of all that's happening, John takes these two chapters to focus on this particular aspect, this particular facet of the vision. And the events here in these chapters are not just central to Revelation, really they're central to all of created reality. So let's take just a moment here. We're just going to read chapter 4. I'd love to read both. We don't have time to do both, but we're going to focus on chapter 4 and, uh, and, and draw from that some things that the Lord would have to say to us today. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. In the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly, I was in the Spirit. And I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald encircled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. 
And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold Spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Now, there's a lot going on in this chapter. There's a lot of detail. Everything here, everything <laughs> means something. Um, and, and it would honestly take multiple sermons, multiple mornings to even begin to scratch the surface here. But what we're going to do instead is just try to focus on, to key on some of the principal figures of the chapter. The first and, and most important, of course, is the first thing John beholds as he's taken away in the spirit to the throne room of heaven. And that is the one sitting on the throne. The one who is as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, with a glow of an emerald encircling his throne like a rainbow. John, in this vision, is trying to explain to us in words that you and I can understand, with images that you and I can understand, with ideas that, that draw from human experience as well as all throughout the Old Testament. He's trying to explain to us this, this sight of the king of heaven, the creator of all there is. The brilliance like precious gemstones represents his majesty and his glory. And surrounding him with a, a rainbow-like glow uh, is, this, is this picture that, that takes us all the way back to the days of Noah. And it reminds us that, that as judgments issue forth from this throne in the chapters to come, there is always this behind the judgments, this invitation to come to the one who issues them and receive mercy and grace. Of course, chapter 5 belongs with chapter 4, and, and it doesn't take very long in chapter 5 before we see that, that there's another figure here with, with the one on the throne, and it is the Lamb. And then in front of the throne, in chapter 4, verse, verse 5, are these seven flames which indicate the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. And so here, in this, these few verses of, of human words and human language and, and human concepts for you and me to understand, John is describing for us, as best he can, this incredible encounter with the triune God. Now surrounding the throne are 24 more thrones. And he says there's an elder sitting on each one, clothed in white, wearing golden crowns on their heads. Now that number 24, it has all sorts of significance and, and carries with it rich allusions to the Old Testament. But I, I believe its ultimate significance is found later in Revelation chapter 21, where that number refers to the sum of the 12 patriarchs of Israel in the Old Testament, plus the 12 apostles of the New. And so what John is seeing is this representation of the entire complete people of God, the church. Not two separate peoples, but one. Who Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 2, have been raised with Christ and are seated with him in the heavenly places. This is a picture of God amidst his people. But again, they are not all. There's, there's another group of figures here that we find in verse 6. So you have the throne, the one seated on the throne. In chapter 5, you have the lamb with the, with the one seated on the throne. You have the, the fullness of the Spirit of God present there, through the, the, depicted by these seven flames. You have surrounding the throne, 24 more thrones with elders. And then lastly, in verse 6 of chapter 4, these four living beings. 
the details of which recall the imagery from visions of Ezekiel and Isaiah. And you can turn to those, those passages in your, in your time throughout this week to, to look at the, all the, the imagery that comes from the Old Testament there. But together here, they represent the whole created order of animate life. And they're seen here, they're depicted here, doing the, that function that all of creation was created to do. And that is to declare the glory of God endlessly for all eternity. Now, as John is, is taking all of this in, remember, this, this comes right after the, the things that Jesus says for John to write in his letters to the churches. So as John is composing these letters, if not by hand yet, but at least in his mind and in his heart, what is the function behind this next scene? Well, I think the primary feature, one that you cannot avoid because it's really the first thing he sees, is the centrality of the throne. Notice how in the midst of all this activity, all that's going on, there is this expression of the sovereignty of God. That is the central feature here. The absolute, all-powerful sovereignty of God. He is the one who is absolutely in control of all that is going on. He is the one around whom all of reality circles and revolves. He is the one who holds everything in his hands, even the powers of evil and the powers of rebellion. In fact, all throughout Revelation, it is repeated over and over and over again, this idea that, that evil is only permitted to exist. It is only permitted to operate because he superintends it for his glory and for the good of his people. The evil in the world, while he is not the direct cause of it, he permits it and it, he is superintends it for his greater purposes. And we will keep reiterating that for as, as, however, more, however many more weeks we're here in Revelation. We're going to keep drawing our hearts and our minds back to the, this fundamental truth that you and I have to keep at the forefront at every moment of our lives. And that is that God is in control. God is in control. Now you may feel like your life is out of control. And maybe it is this morning. And maybe you and I need to be reminded of that fact. That you and I, as much as we work and as much as we strive and we put all this effort and energy into keeping everything exactly how we want it, at the end of the day, you can't control everything. But I hope you have given your life to the one who does. I hope you've placed your life in the hands of the one who holds all of history in his hands. The one who is seated on the throne. Now that sovereignty of God is reinforced here by this shiny sea of glass. You know, when we read through these, we're so enamored by, by the lightning and the thunder and the gems and the halo and the, and the activity that maybe it didn't happen to you, but it happened to me. Almost every time I've ever read chapter 4, I glance over verse 6, the first half of verse 6, almost like it's not even there. Oh, in front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. But in the center and around the throne are these weird beings. We just skip right over that little detail. But if you will recall from a couple weeks ago, what does the sea represent? Well, the sea represents the reality of evil. It, after all, as we're told later in chapter 11, like we were in a number of weeks ago, it, or chapter 13, it is the home of the dragon, the great enemy of God's people. Chapters 12, 12 and 13, the home of the dragon, the home of the beast. This is where chaos and evil originate from. And yet, and yet, in the presence of God, it is as smooth as glass and as clear as crystal. The waters are stilled. The waters and what they represent are subdued. In the presence of God. Now one cannot help but wonder if as John is beholding this, this symbolic representation of the reality of God's sovereignty over evil. If he wasn't taken back to that fateful night on the Sea of Galilee. You remember the one when the disciples were, were crossing over and Jesus was with them. And, and after a long day of ministry Jesus was, was lulled to sleep by the, the slow rocking of the boat. And there he is. Maybe even snoring away as the winds began to whip and the lightning began to flash 
and the rain began to fall to the point where they thought their lives were going to end. Jesus, wake up. Don't you care what's going on here? We're about to die. And Jesus stands up as cool as a cucumber. Peace. Be still. The waters are no match for Jesus. Or how about another time? Maybe not too long after that. They're crossing back across the same sea. And this time, Jesus isn't even with them. They're completely alone this time. And these guys must not have been very good at reading the weather because here they are in the exact same predicament. What is that? It's Jesus walking across the waves. Do you see what, what that is intending to communicate to these men and to you and me today? What about the countless times when these guys who were expert fishermen had spent all day and night pulling up empty nets and then Jesus comes along and almost with a little twinkle in his eye says, hey, put the net out on that side of the boat. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Not to Jesus. Jesus. Because on that side of the boat is, is so much fish that their net's breaking to haul it in. Jesus is the master mariner. Jesus is the conqueror of chaos. Jesus is the sovereign Lord of all. The one who walks across the chaos of the world and invites you and me to join him. We sing about it. This morning, the choir sang about it this morning. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Through the storm, he is Lord of all. And like faithful Peter, who was able to walk across the waves when he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, so too do all of us who turn to him in faith and listen to his voice. In fact, in chapter 15, verse 2, that little sea of, that sea of glass, guess what's going on there? The saints are standing on it. They're standing on it. And they're singing the song of Moses. And in chapter 21, as, as the new Jerusalem descends out of heaven, guess what? There's no sea at all. The evil that is in the world around you is not only under the sovereign control of God. God enables you and me to walk upon it as if it was just a sheet of glass. And we can do so knowing deep in our hearts by faith that one day it will be vanquished forever. Don't glance over a single word in Revelation. Don't miss a single thing. It all means something. And here, when we're in chapter 4, we see that the centrality of God's throne and His sovereignty means this, that though the waters of your life are raging around you, though you may feel like you came in this morning like this, about to, be, about to succumb to the, the circumstances of your life, barely treading water, barely keeping afloat, barely getting any air, guess what? Every single event of your life is under the control of God. Every single one of them. And his plan for you and his timing for you is perfect. And you can face whatever you're looking at in life with that confidence that knows that at the end of time, you will be vindicated for your faith. Your accusers will be punished forever. And God's glory will be the final statement of your life and not the winds and the waves. But you and I don't need to wait until then to experience and participate in that glory, do you? Do we? Our life together here as the church each week is a reminder of our heavenly existence and identity. 
I don't think, again, I, I'm reiterating what I kind of led with this morning, what I've mentioned several times this morning. I, I don't think that, that the scenes here in chapters 4 and 5 should be read as, as completely distinct from and separate from the, the chapters before. And I've heard people break Revelation down this way. They, they say, well, the, the, the first few chapters are, are Revelation's message to the church in the past. But when you get to, to chapter 4 and chapter 5, it's a message to, to the church of today. And then chapters 6 through to the end are for the church in the future. Well, I, I hope you have seen that, that we've broken that, that way of doing it down. That, that, I don't think that's right. I don't think there's a, a hard line between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. Remember that, that idea of the, the cyclorama, all that's going on around. And, and John is giving us, through these chapters, different aspects, different facets, different dimensions of the same vision. And here at the end of three, as he's, as he's composing or he's hearing from Jesus the things he is to compose to the, to the letters of, in these letters to the churches, he's given He's given this, this, this other dimension to the vision. And it's not as if Jesus is saying, okay, you do that, and when you're done with that, then we'll turn and, and, and do something different. No. I think the next vision in 4 and 5 actually informs the contents of the letters in chapters 1 through 3. It, the, the, the vision in 4 and 5 speaks directly to the message to the churches. You cannot understand the message of the churches without the vision of heaven. Indeed, I think all that John is seeing here and what you and I see through his account should inform every aspect of our lives, not the least of which our worship here as the church on earth today. For starters, this vision of the redeemed in heaven moves worship from something anthropocentric to something theocentric. Now, what do those fancy words mean? Well, something anthropocentric is man-centered, you and me-centered, versus something theocentric is something that's God-centered. Now, maybe that, that, that thing doesn't, that doesn't mean anything to you this morning, perhaps. I don't know. But it's amazing to me how often when we look at the worship of the church and how we, how we understand it, it, we make it all about ourselves. We get all caught up in, in the feels of worship. We get all caught up in the styles or the instruments. We get all bent out of shape about our preferences or our tastes. And, and in the midst of that, we end up missing what it's all about. But that's not the case here in heaven, is it? There's not a single word about the volume of the guitar. Or the beat of the drums. Or the speed or slowness of the songs. Or whether they were hymns or contemporary praise choruses. Not a word. That's because in heaven, those who are worshiping are utterly preoccupied with the glory of God. And so this vision that is informing John's letters to the churches, and as it informs you and my life as Christians and as the people of God, it teaches us that it's not all about us. This vision displaces humanity from the center of things. The elders are not in the middle with the triune God encircling the elders. It's the other way around. He is at the center of our worship. Notice the posture. You can't miss the, Now, you may have missed the sea of glass, but I know you didn't miss the posture of the elders. Every time the, the, the triune God is worshipped as holy, as holy, as holy, the Almighty who was and is and who is still to come. Every single time that is repeated, they prostrate themselves on the ground, casting their thrones before the throne. You know, there's a big difference, isn't there, between acknowledging God and worshiping God. There's a big difference there. You know, when you acknowledge God, you're basically making note of His existence. I know He's there. I even believe He's there. But when you worship God, it involves yielding control to Him. It's when we allow Him to be who He is, not who we want Him to be. It's when we allow Him to have access to all of our hearts, not just bits and pieces here and there. It's when we allow God to govern and to rule and to, to speak 
on his terms and not our terms. Sadly, you and I probably spend way too much time clamoring for a seat in the throne room while being unwilling to take off our crowns. And so, we define God in ways that allow us to hold on to our values or to keep up with the the things that we enjoy, the, the habits that define our lives, the relationships that make us feel good. We set boundaries on what God can or cannot say or do. And when we worship, oftentimes it's to appease him or even manipulate him for our benefit. We want to fit him into our agenda. I need to feel this way. I need this thing to happen in my life. And so I'm going to go do this thing, and maybe as a result, God will do this thing back for me. That's that's the very essence of paganism right there. There's an invisible world out there, and if I can somehow manipulate what's around me, I can get the invisible world to do something good for me. Is that how you worship? Is that how I worship? Rather than worship objects made by human hands, or even rather than worshiping some caricature of God that we have depicted out of our own imaginations, we must worship the God who revealed himself definitively through Jesus Christ. True worship, the worship we heard about this morning from Master Eli. I love the, t- the title. Did he give himself that title? or did some- Okay, no. Someone gave him the title, Master, Master Eli. Those, God, the Father is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. True worship is about Him. It's not about you and me. It's not about what serves the worshiper. It's what magnifies His greatness. It's not us manipulating Him. It's us surrendering our our hearts to Him, the control of our lives to Him. Not just a single point in time, but continuously. Notice that every single time, forever and ever and ever, that that the, the, the living beings worship God, the elder's response is the same. It's not just, hey, I worship you. I did my duty. I'm good. No. It is a continual casting of the crowns. It is a continual prostration of the self before his holiness and his sovereignty and the beauty and majesty of his being. And as you and I, who are still on earth today, read these words, we're reminded that this this future that we're headed towards, that is present for some now and and future for us then, should inform how you and I live all of life in the present That continuous casting of the crowns tells me that all of my life is to be a perpetual, habitual, continual yes to him. I say yes to you. In every circumstance, in every relationship, in every decision, through every moment, I'm not going to compartmentalize my yeses to you so that I say yes here and no here. If, if the throne of heaven is the, is the center of your life, there's no compartmentalization. It's him or nothing. It's either him or me. And so revelation effectively draws a dividing line between conflicting sovereignties. Who's Lord over my life? Is it Jesus or is it anything else? Who am I going to worship? Where is my allegiance? This passage puts our faith to the test. Either he's Lord of my life and all of my life, or there's something in my heart that is still under the sway of fallen Babylon. This passage puts our faith to the test. And that's why I believe Sunday morning worship is so critical. In my small group this last Wednesday night, in our discussion time, we were going through experiencing God, and just through our open discussion time, uh, one of the members of the of the, of the group mentioned how he has friends who say they're Christians, but they don't go to church. And they think, I, I don't need to go to church. I can be a Christian. I can have a relationship with God. And the, and the, the list goes on and on and on. And then, and then you and I know the others who, who, who don't necessarily believe that, but they certainly don't see coming to church as a weekly part of their life, something to really be emphasized. I'll go when it's convenient. I'll go when there's not my favorite team on the TV. I'll go when I, when I get enough sleep the night before. I'll go when I'm in a particu- having a particularly bad week and I really just need a pick-me-up. 
I think Sunday morning worship, there's actually a whole lot of reasons why it's important, but I think it's especially important as we're, as we're thinking about these things from Revelation 4 this morning, is, is that it's crucial to our lives because really it's an orienting reality. When we model our worship after heavenly liturgy that we see in the Bible, it provides a much needed calibration for those of us who live our lives in the world but are not of the world. It is here. When we gather together and we, we follow the pattern that is laid out before us where we worship and magnify the greatness and the goodness of the being of God and celebrate the riches that we have in Christ and all that he has done for us in giving us his life and the fullness of his spirit, it is then that we're challenged to make sure that the throne that the Lord occupies is not just somewhere off in the clouds, but it's right here in the center of our hearts. Does he occupy that throne? What do you do throughout your week that ensures that is true? If nothing else, it happens here. The king of all of heaven, the king of all the earth, must be the king of all of me. And whatever crowns I think I possess, they belong to him. I give give them. They're, 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 they don't compare to you. Nothing in my life compares to him. He is everything and more. And the reality is, every created thing in all of, in all of existence finds its, its significance in its placement around that throne. All the earth's inhabitants are judged on the basis of their attitude to God's claim to rule. How you respond to that claim will determine your fate. And you and I can either look at that throne and we can clench our fists and our jaw and we can say no or we can get lost in wonder, love, and praise. Those are the options. The one who was and is and is still to come. He is the one who is sovereign over all of history. Therefore, you and I can stand strong in the face of whatever is going on in our life. He's the one who brought all things into being. It is by his will that all things are sustained. He initiated history and he's very much in control of it despite the appearances. You and I are not here by accident. There's purpose for your life. And that purpose, and that meaning, is not found within yourself, but in Him. The one who chose you before the foundation of the world to be His cherished possession. Isn't that amazing? That before God created a single thing, He bore you in His heart. Think about that. You're not an afterthought. You're not some sort of side effect. You're not that unwanted child that was kept just out of necessity or out of obligation. God bore you in his heart before you were born. And when you and I come into a a place like this, and as we express our total heart devotion to him, We are effectively reciprocating back to him what he already offers you and me. He's so, how devoted is God to you? Behold the cross. And when you and I express our devotion back to him through our praise and our worship and our whole lives as living sacrifices, we image that very one. His life becomes our life. We express that to the world. In fact, you and I, right here, right now, as we worship together, are a living snapshot of the heavenly cyclorama. You and I, when we worship as the people of God on earth as it is in heaven, manifest the very glory of the Holy One Himself with hearts turned outward in self-giving love. Can that be said of your life this morning? Whether you're here in the flesh or whether you're listening 
online or watching on YouTube, wherever, wherever you are within the sound of my voice, does the one who holds all of human history in his hands have possession of your whole heart? Do you belong to him? Whoever you are, the truth is the cross of Jesus will be the determining factor of your future as well as your present. Those who reject this offering of himself choose to receive the wrath of God. That is a picture as much of wrath as it is of mercy. But those who lose their life in this moment for his sake will find it and join the saints in heaven for all of eternity who worship the Lamb before the throne. There's a really fascinating and beautiful progression throughout Revelation that begins, I think, in chapter 4, here in verse 1. You remember, the first thing we saw is that John heard this voice of the voice of Jesus, and it said, to look. And when John looks, what does he see? He sees a door standing open in heaven. Later in chapter 11, verses 13, he writes, Then in heaven the temple of God was opened and the Ark of the Covenant could be seen inside the temple. And then in chapter 19, as we progress, he says, Then I saw all of heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. So what began in the beginning with the voice of Jesus pointing John to a door ended with all of heaven open and Jesus himself there waiting to receive. To me, that says, he's inviting us to himself. Jesus is inviting you to himself. Will you listen? Will you surrender? Will you prostrate your heart before him? Will you take whatever accomplishments you have, whatever authority you have, whatever victories you have, whatever, anything in your life that you're proud of, anything that you've ever done that is good, anything that you cherish, will you take that off and lay it before him? When was the last time you knelt before the throne? I'm going to invite you to do that right now. Here in a moment, I'm going to pray. Jeff and the team are going to come and sing and lead us in worship. If you want to come and kneel, there's pads on the floor for you. Now, we don't know if there's pads on the floor of, of heaven, but we've got them here. Or maybe you just want to kneel in your chair, or maybe you're just kneeling in your heart. You respond as the Lord is leading you, but I invite you to respond to this, this snapshot of worship in the only way that is appropriate to kneel, to bow, to submit. To say, Jesus, I hear you calling my name, and here I am. Look, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. And those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to you and to me. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, King, Creator, Lord of all, we repent of our worship of ourselves and our idols. We repent for the ways that we have made worship about us instead of you. We, had, we confess this morning that none of us have perfectly imaged this picture from Re Revelation chapter 4 in our lives. Some of us may never have even come close. And yet, Lord, this morning, you're calling us to pattern not only our worship services, but all of our lives after this image of ultimate reality. Lord, help us to say no to ourselves and our tastes and our preferences and our demands for our way and to say yes to you. To say yes to you, even, even if it's uncomfortable. And I think the message of Revelation says it will be. 
even if our yes to you results in, living, in losing everything we have, even our very lives. Lord, we know that those who lose their lives for your sake now will find it in you forever. Holy Spirit, be speaking to the hearts of these people now and lead us to respond in a way that brings you glory and honor and praise now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. You've been given the invitation. Come now as you feel led and let us worship him together. Mm -hmm.